Hey, we are so glad you're here. This service is going to be incredible. We have a guest worship leader with us, Ryan Kondo. I've worked with Ryan for many years. The worship and praise is going to be incredible. Ron is going to be teaching on relationships, specifically marriage, this weekend. And, you know, it's just, there's so many things that we need help with in our relationships and in marriage. I want to encourage you to tune in and trust that the Holy Spirit is going to help us. A couple things. Number one, I want to encourage you to hit that share button and share this with some friends or family that could be encouraged. The gospel will be super clear. Also, Let us know you're here. Let us hear from you in the comments section. We have people praying for each other and encouraging each other. Really believe the Lord is going to be with us and encourage us. Let's enjoy the service together. God bless you. to see you guys here. Welcome to those of you joining us online. We are so excited to worship this morning. We have Ryan Kondo here. He's a leader at Radiant Church in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and a good friend of ours. We are so blessed by his heart for worship and prayer and for the prayer movement. We're really excited to have him lead with us. So yeah, wherever you are, let's just stand together as we praise the name of Jesus.
so great to worship with you. So glad you guys are here. Let's, uh, let's sing about the love of Jesus today, amen? out all fear. Lord, we remember your love. We remember how, Lord, you laid your life down. King of all, the one who was there from the beginning, who came close, took on our frame, came obedient even to the point of death on a cross. Lord, we remember your love. We remember your body broken, your blood poured out today. 
You're the king that we love. You're the king that we adore. So we just set our eyes on you right now, Jesus, and remember your love.
that's on the back of the seat, fill it out and drop it in the offering receptacles when you leave this morning. And those of you who are watching online, you can do the same too by texting the word CONNECT to the number on the screen. Also, if you have a prayer request, just add your telephone number and a member from our prayer team or a staff member will call you back or feel free to call the church office. Just a reminder, we will be taking the offering at the end of service. You will see ways to give up on the screen, and there are offering receptacles on the back walls at each of the exit doors. Well, there's something exciting and awesome happening out in the atrium, and Steve and Josh McKinney are gonna tell us all about it. Let's take a look at the screen. Hey everyone, I'm Steve, pastor of our East Campus. And I'm Josh McKinney, I'm the son of the pastor of our East Campus. And we just wanted to tell you guys about an important mission we're doing at our East Campus. Mission 111 is our mission outreach at East Campus. We're doing good in sharing God's love in Haiti and in the Philippines and locally. We feed the hungry, provide medical care, and we empower through education and employment. So this weekend in the atrium, check out our Mission Boutique. It's handmade goods from Haitian artisans, um, just in time for Mother's Day. Josh, you get your mom anything for Mother's Day? Not yet, but when I do, I will for sure go to the Mission Boutique. And that is because every time you purchase an item, you're providing jobs and feeding the hungry. And you're also a big part of someone's story. That is very true. And the, the Mission Boutique is not the only way you can help Mission 111. Here's, here's why. Next Saturday, April 24th, is Mission 111's telethon, both on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. 
and you guys can help us out simply by watching and sharing this event. Awesome, this telethon will actually raise enough money to help keep Mission 111 operating in three different countries for the next year. And you know, 2 Thessalonians 1.11 says, may he give you the power to accomplish all the good things that your faith prompts you to do. And we hope that your faith prompts you to both shop in the boutique and watch our telethon next Saturday. Amen, amen. I already picked up some earrings, so ladies, you better get out there quick because I already got a bunch of them. All right. So we want to encourage you to join small groups and classes here at Grace Church. You can check out the information about all those classes on the E! News and also on the Grace website. This is really a great time to grow spiritually in those classes and also connect with your church family. So we encourage you to check those out. Speaking of classes, Discover Grace classes are going on this month. They occur every month. Uh, you don't have to take them in order. You can take them out of sequence, so join in any time. It gives you the opportunity to see the history of Grace Church and then figure out your gifts and callings and how you fit into God's great big plan. And so those classes this month are online only, but next month they'll resume on campus as well as online. So we encourage you to take those classes. If you're gonna be a member of Grace Church or you're, you're looking into that, these are the classes that you wanna take. So with that being said, let's move on. Miss Patty, what's going on next Saturday for the ladies? Girl, I'm so glad you asked. The Women of Grace, we're having a brand new event called The Conversation. It's about real talk around real issues with real women like you and me in the presence of a real savior. So if you're ready for some girl talk, some real talk, Grab your neighbor, your co-workers, and all your girlfriends, and come to the conversation. Ooh, this is gonna be a free event. It's gonna be located in the upper atrium from 10 to 11.30. There's gonna be continental breakfast. We also offer childcare. Now for childcare, you will have to sign up ahead of time for that, but you don't wanna miss this. We're gonna hear and learn what kingdom conversations sound like. We're gonna learn what the Father sounds like when he's speaking to your heart about your situation. And then when we learn that, when we receive that, we can freely give it away to each other because we're, we're better, better together. together. <laughs> Amen, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your kindness, your faithfulness, how gentle you are. We are so grateful to you, Lord. We ask that you anoint the message that Pastor Ron is bringing out and that those words that go forth will land on some really good soil today, that you will take those words and cause them to accomplish what you set them out to accomplish. So open our eyes, open our ears, and cause our hearts to hunger for more of you, Lord. That's what you want for us, so that's what we want. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. It just sounds better with an English accent, doesn't it? I mean, it just sounds more authoritative. I wish I could do that. Uh, man, it was so good having Ryan Kondo with us again this, this weekend. I just love that guy. I used to, I used to watch him at the prayer room uh, in Kansas City when he would, uh, he was there for like a decade and, and uh, would lead, you know, two hour sets and, and it's just so exciting to have him with us and his wife got to meet her as well. So uh, we're happy. The scripture we just listened to was from the Apostle Paul. He's writing a church that had every form of division and sin imaginable and yet his challenge was real simple, love one another. We uh, started our church singing a little 
song out of 1 John 4, 7 and 8. It's beloved, let us love one another. How many of you remember that song? Ah, that dates you. <laughs> Tells how old you are. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And this is when you turn around. Beloved, let us love one another. First John 4, 7 and 8. <laughs> you actually, actually included. It. Now see, some of you have said, why don't you sing those scripture songs again? Now you know. Because <laughs> They were like little kids' songs. But I'll tell you, it got, the, it got the idea embedded in our hearts that this is, this is the issue. He that loveth not knoweth not God, <laughs> for God is love. And it's still the antidote. I mean, for all the racial division, cultural junk that we've got going and are surrounded by right now, 1 Corinthians 13 is Paul fleshing it out for us. He said, love is patient, kind. It doesn't envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude, demanding, irritable, resentful. Love doesn't keep score. It rejoices in truth and always looks for the best. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of the three is love. So, you know, this is a huge deal for us as Christians. That, that, you know, that just sounds so poetic and romantic, doesn't it? That's why we still read it at weddings. But love is the most challenging assignment God has ever given us because it makes us the most like his son. And unfortunately, it's no longer the motivation for marriage. People don't marry someone to love. They go looking for the perfect person to love them perfectly so they can be fulfilled. Somebody who will complete them and help them live happily ever after. Those are you know, phrases that we become familiar with. A few weeks back, I heard a pastor my age share his advice when he's counseling young married people. He, he uh, tells these couple, he has, sits them down. He said, look, you two need to know that God ordained this relationship in heaven before the foundation of the world. And he did it to kill you. Both. It's a divine trap. You can't make it without dying. He said, that's not what they want to hear. But uh, then he adds, he, said, he, he adds, thank God that in his sovereign wisdom, he gave us humans all these delicious hormones so we'd be totally insane until we've fallen into the trap and can't get out. And that's why you're sitting here talking to me. As Christians, you are both called to take up your cross and die daily. So that's my marriage counseling for you. You both just need to die and get over yourself. Now, you, you can die like a lamb or you can die like a pig and throw blood and mess all over everybody, but die is what you both need to do. He has a very light counseling load. <laughs> Bit too much reality for most people. You, you know, the Apostle Paul was a little more nuanced, but basically said some of the same stuff here in Ephesians 5. He said, husbands, love your wives, and this is the clincher, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of what, with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one has ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. So marriage is a picture of Jesus in his church. It's why God married Adam and Eve in Genesis 2. He wants us to see and understand what his devotion to us looks like. He is totally committed to our well-being. As imperfect as we are, he chose us calls us by name, he loves us in all of our messiness, but he doesn't leave us that way. And he makes us perfect with his sacrificial embrace. He enjoys showing us mercy. He desires to be one with us. Marriage was God's design and plan from the beginning. It's the picture of, of, of all that. It's, it's a gift that comes wrapped in a cross. Somebody said, it's a round hole our square-shaped hearts get hammered into. In marriage, we learn that love and self-sacrifice are virtually synonymous. Think about this. Why, why is love patient? 
because it often has to endure the person we love acting like a, like a jerk. Why is love kind? Because it has to suffer through their mean and thoughtless words. Why does it not boast? Because frequently it weathers their humiliation and yet stays devoted. Why does it keep no record of wrongs? Because, because life doesn't work when it's all about scorekeeping. Now here's more of that passage in 1 John uh, 4. It says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. It's in the nitty gritty day after dayness of living with a less than loving loved one that our selfishness gets demolished. That's how we allow God to perfect us. It's, it's learning how to love like Jesus in a committed relationship with somebody who's imperfect. Paul's elegant chapter on love is also the classic chapter on humanity's lovelessness. He's saying that when we love, we always love people who will sooner or later act in ways that are unworthy of it. So love is not an epic fairy tale, it's your story of sacrifice. It's putting the other person ahead of yourself. That's how character gets formed in us and, and we start to reflect Jesus to a love-starved world. Presently in America, people are avoiding the whole process. They just, nah, you know. Commitment has almost become a dirty word. And young people are getting married later in life. They, in 2020, men marrying for the first time were 31 and women 28. Divorce and remarriage are way more frequent. And dating is pretty much synonymous with cohabiting nowadays. Back in 1963, two thirds of people in their 20s were married, compared to only a third today. That's how fast things have changed. The marriage rate is the lowest in 150 years. People are just living together. And sadly, most American adults think that's a good idea, even though God strictly forbids it in Scripture, it spells it out clearly. And in this series, I wanna help us see why that it's a, for our protection, that God's not trying to keep us from something good, he's trying to protect us from getting our hearts smashed. So first I wanna zero in on how God defines marriage and why this is one of the most important projects that we can ever undertake. We're gonna get his vision for what it is, how it works, and if you're not married but wanna be, or if you are married, maybe for the second or third time, and you're wondering you know, if you're gonna make it this time, I really think this is gonna help us. I really think this is gonna solidify and ground us in what the Bible says about this. I'm, I'm really praying that it will. In fact, Holy Spirit, would you just come among us and, and help us now? Give us your understanding and vision of what this wonderful thing called marriage is and is about. We pray that in your powerful name, in Jesus' name, amen. So here we go, we're going back to Genesis 2, 7. The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man. So God creates this human being in his own likeness, puts him in a place made just for him. It's kind of an arboretum meets animal adventure park, you know, it's, a, it's the ultimate man cave. <laughs> I mean, this, this thing was paradise on steroids. And then God makes this crazy statement. In verse 18, he says, it is not good for man to be alone. Now the reason that's crazy sounding is because he's literally hanging out with God. But he's letting us know that his design for man wasn't complete. He said, I will make a helper suitable for him. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. This is where the rumor is born that guys are often asleep when their relationships begin. What, we're dating? When did that happen? <laughs> and while he was sleeping, God took one of his ribs, made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. The man said, and these are the first words ever documented in human history, it's pure poetry. He says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Verse 24, this is, that is why a man leaves his father and mother. Paul quoted this. And is united to his wife. This is why people marry. And they become one flesh. God performed the ceremony here. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. There's perfect intimacy. A man and a woman come together with no clothes. There's not a single thought of does he think I'm fat or, you know, do I look good to her? You know, there's no insecurity. 
And I hope you notice it's Adam and Eve. There's no mention of any other gender anywhere in the Bible. I mean, scripture is real clear on this because we seem to have gotten off the track. God created us so that even our male and female bodies are designed to fit together sexually in some ways and not others. There's a natural structure, a natural law that the Bible's in agreement with. He took the woman out of the man, and we're gonna see why that's such a big deal. We're, gonna, we're uniquely designed for each other. I love that, I, I read this, or actually heard this quote from Ray Orland, uh, who's a pastor of a church. He said, this is why I could never agree with same-sex marriage. Same-sex marriage makes sense if marriage were just a more intense form of human friendship. If all human relationships are on one continuum with hostility at one end and love at the other end and just different degrees of those, then marriage would be just a more intense form of friendship, a more intense form of love. Okay, then I could understand same-sex marriage. But what the Bible is saying is that marriage is of a different order altogether. Healthy friendships have boundaries. The whole point of marriage is one flesh. No boundaries, no barriers. So when a man and a woman get married on their wedding day, as they take their vows in the sight of God, he joins them together, and then they're surrounded by a morally impenetrable barrier, and within that Garden of Eden, that circle, there are no barriers between them. All the guardedness falls away. There's nothing else like that. In the garden, there was a man and a woman, and God says, I want you to work together. I want you to become one and multiply. So we're gonna start right there. We're gonna look at three reasons for getting married to a member of the opposite sex from the original wedding planner. (laughs) This is the architect of the human race telling us what marriage is and what it's for. I mean, nobody knows more about the marriage project than our creator. First reason to marry, we need help. God says it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper for him. And the original Hebrew word there is ezer, which means partner, helpmate. Now some women you know, think that sounds degrading, but if, it's, if it was degrading, it would be degrading to men. Because I mean, it'd be God saying, you're helpless, bro. You know what I mean? Let, <laughs> let, me, let me give you somebody who'll help you get the job done, you know, who knows how to do it. But the help goes both ways. And the word is actually 16 times used in the Old Testament for God as our Ezer. So, so it's a word describing his humility and character. And he tells us in Ephesians 5, 21, what it looks like. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. To submit means to surrender, yield, prefer, to help one another. And we do it out of our love for Jesus. So I'm gonna bottom line this. Marriage is God's preferred method of preparing us for eternity. More than any other relationship, it helps us learn to deny ourselves. (laughs) I bet you've never heard that definition of marriage. And it's not because we want to or we enjoy it or it's just easier when you're married because actually it's harder. And young people, I'll level with you. In the beginning, it's way harder. I mean, it's way harder. Now, of course, you know, there are joys and highs and all kind of intimacy and happiness along the way. But, I mean, let's be honest. It is a daunting task to learn to integrate and become one and do life together with a person that is totally different than you. But it's the dailiness of marriage that gives us the space to figure it out. We get almost endless opportunities to learn how to love this person in practical ways, to understand who they are, to get the focus off me, 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 me. God's master plan is to make us more like his son. That's what this life is for. And one of the big ways that he does that is by coupling us with somebody in the bond of marriage who's completely different, and in fact, so completely different that we spend a lifetime trying to figure them out. Because beyond the male-female thing is the fact that, you know, uh, and we're almost total opposites, I mean, in so many ways, there's also the temperament thing. Often God has wired one of us an extrovert and the other an introvert. One loves noise, the other loves quiet. And what's fascinating is how enduring, endearing rather, and how cute it was before we got married. (laughs) You love the way he was always drumming on things and telling funny jokes, and he loved the cool way you could talk about your feelings for hours. Now he drives you crazy, and he wishes you would get to the point. Is there a point? 
You married couples? All the magical fairy tale come true stuff vanishes pretty quick, doesn't it? I mean, it's, for Debbie and me, it ended on our honeymoon. I kid you not, we, were, we went to Steamboat Springs, Colorado, because I love to ski, and I was convinced I could teach her to love it too in a couple hours. And uh, you know, Debbie wanted to go to a, a beach in Florida, but anyway, uh, you'll get a kick out of this. So not only am I a couple of days into marriage, now my, I'm my bride's new ski instructor, which is a bad idea even if it isn't your honeymoon. Don't teach your spouse, how to, your wife, how to ski. Well, it gets, it, it gets better. Right from the start, I take her up a lift where an intermediate slope was the only way down. Yeah, but it was only intermediate for like 100 yards or so. So I figured, ah, you know, what, what could happen? I'm, I'm good at this and I know I can help her. Well, if you've gone skiing, you know, you freak out. If you freak out on a bunny slope. And so, yes, you know. <laughs> The bunny slope was boring me to tears, you know, and, and I was just convinced I was gonna be able to do this. Well, you get the pictures, you know. I had proven what a prize I was in no time flat. I mean, she could, she would have speared me with her ski pole had I been close enough. And I, I say that because she, she threw it at me like a javelin. <laughs> Sitting on her bed that night, we both cried our eyes out. I mean, we confessed our fear about what we'd have gotten ourselves into and just, you know, just poured our hearts out. <laughs> Ladies, you know, here's the simple truth. Even if you married the perfect man, and Adam was that guy, I mean, sin guaranteed the rest of us or not, but even if you had Adam before sin, no one can make you forever happy. There's only one man that can do that. <laughs> And thinking they can, thinking a, the, the guy can, will put an unrealistic expectation on that person they'll never be able to live up to. And uh, back in March, Debbie and I celebrated 43 years of marriage together. <laughs> yeah, you're clapping for her. <laughs> That's amazing she stuck with you. <laughs> it is. Uh, it really is. I mean, we, we raised two kids. She's helped me navigate the last four decades pastor in this church with a whole lot of grace and mercy. Could have never done it without her help. And I, I'm more awed by the wisdom of God putting us together more and more every, every year we're together. I mean, we started Grace Church eight weeks into marriage. That is a bad idea, too. I made a lot of them. So I would not advise that. The second reason for marriage is to raise children according to God's plan. God says, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. Have babies. Tell them who I am. This is actually where the Great Commission begins, in our homes, with our children. And I want to you know, expand that because I believe adoption, foster care, all of that plays into this. We've got a lot of families who have adopted here. Deuteronomy 6.5 is where God tells us, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength. Commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home, and when you're on the road, and when you're going to bed, and when you're getting up. God says, this is how I intend for life to work. Your, your love for me and my word are gonna be born in the earliest days of life, in the security of your own home and family. It's gonna be built day by day, reinforce one lesson upon another, and I want it to be modeled by a dad and a mom loving each other. This is part of a biblical worldview that answers the what is real question. It's what lies at the co core of our beliefs because our beliefs answer the what is true question. From our beliefs come our values, goals, and goals that answer the what is good question, out of which comes our behavior that answers the what do we do question. So we're talking about core beliefs, goals, and behavior. Now if you have a self-centered worldview, uh, and, and you, you talk about marriage, the answer to the what is real question is me. My desires, my feelings, my time, my stuff, that's what's real. The what is true question, that's all relative. You know, truth is whatever I believed it to be. My goal is to find what does it for me. I need someone who gets me, who completes me. To the what is good question, sex feels good. And kids, well, you know, they eat up a lot of time and money. 
There's not much payback in that. My goal is pleasure. Anything that satisfies my desires is good. And if that's your worldview, you date around and get stuck. That's where we're at in America right now. We're caught in a totally self-centered worldview that's all about me. But let's say you put God at the center. Here's what a biblical worldview looks like. To answer the question of what is real, Jesus is real, his kingdom is real, his plans and purposes are real. God created you for a purpose. You're not a genetic coincidence. There's a reason for your life. I just finished an excellent book called The Story of Reality. It's by a guy named Gregory Kokel. And it's a brilliant explanation. This is on the cover of how the world began, how it ends, and everything important that happens in between. <laughs> if you want the cliff notes on a wor biblical worldview, this is your book. It's, it's just so good. What is true? God's word. The Bible is true. And it informs everything I do, everything I think, like what I think about relationships and what I do with my nights and weekends and the way I treat people. What is good? God's word says marriage is good. Fidelity, children are good, as well as sing singleness and purity. First Corinthians 7, uh, verse eight, the apostle Paul said, it's better to remain single, but marry if you can't control yourself. <laughs> it's better to marry than lust. So what do we do? We marry, and these days my advice would be to marry in your 20s. Guys in particular, don't get stuck in the self-pleasing me culture like so many young men are today. Don't waste your youth. Don't waste your strength on unreality. Start building a family while you're young enough and have energy for it. God made you for hard work. He made you for responsibility. You've got what it takes to raise this next generation. Have children, teach them to love God and people. That's the most fulfilling thing you will ever do in this life. Looking back, I wish we'd had more. Debbie wanted more, it was me, Mr. Selfish here, who was struggling to deal with that. With that. But now, looking back, man, I wish I'd have you know, gotten into it and had more children. And let me address a cultural issue here. The reason we have so much teen suicide right now is particularly with young males, because that's where, I mean, it's off the chart. It has everything to do with what we're talking about. Young men need a purpose and a call to adventure. And without it, they're just gonna end up becoming grown infants who eventually ask themselves the question, what's the point? I heard Charlie Kirk address this, and it was just, it, it was so brilliant what he said. He said, in our society, parents and pastors need to say, no, there's more than a point. You need a purpose. Purpose comes from the Greek word telos, which is where we get the word telescope. It means out in the distance, a north star, something I can see and try to achieve, something that gives me direction, something that enables me to define what I'm doing every single day. What we've done is the opposite. We've locked young men down in the basement with energy drinks and video games, staying up till five in the morning, thinking somehow that's gonna give them fulfillment. And now we're wondering why more young people have committed suicide than have died of the Chinese coronavirus. Our leaders have failed this generation on this issue. They've abandoned young people in America. I think he's right. I think this lockdown has done far more damage than the disease. I mean, seriously, seriously. The second you see any person in your you know, sphere that you, might, that you even suspect might be going down this road, call them, text them, help them get help. Because we've had that tragedy visit our church. Okay, for those of you who are single, and the what, is, what do we do question, we wanna honor God with our singleness and love him with all our heart and soul and mind and strength and love people as we love ourselves. We've even had single people who have you know, uh, taken on foster care for a season. Single, married, divorced, remarried, widowed, we wanna do everything for the glory of God. So, let me say it again, God made marriage, he asked us to have babies and discipline them, or disciple them. God's basic order is marriage, sex, babies. And the cool thing is God made sex feel real good. But the pleasure serves a purpose. If sex felt like you know, a root canal minus the laughing gas, I mean, how long do you think it would take for the extinction of humanity? I mean, if the thing we do to make babies really hurt and nobody wanted to do it, it'd be generation one and done, you know? We're, but God made it feel good. So we, 
wouldn't be able to keep our hands to ourselves and babies would fill the earth. And Proverbs 5.18 is how we're supposed to handle that, how, how that's supposed to work. God says, rejoice in the wife of your youth. Be intoxicated always in her love, in her love, the one person. God wants your marriage relationship to totally satisfy that aspect of your being. But again, and I, you know, this is where nobody told me this, you have to work at that. It doesn't just happen. And porn has seriously messed up our expectations and understanding of how this all works. It's ruining couples' ability to enjoy sex the way God intended it. You wanna treat porn like the poison it is. And I'm gonna be blunt because this stuff has gotten into our elementary schools. Young people, if you look at this stuff, you won't be able to get those images out of your mind. And they will reprogram your sex drive for something that is totally unrealistic and nothing like the reality of a marital relationship. Don't ruin your chances for experiencing the oneness that God has planned for you with a cheap sex thrill that'll leave you impotent and uninterested in sex with your spouse. And I know what I'm talking about because too many people's lives have been ruined in our church. Too many marriages have been ruined. Porn is a drug that will, will never leave you satisfied. It will swallow you and send you in a shame spiral that'll ruin your life. And if you're already addicted, I want, I want you to know there's hope, all right? We have a men and women of focus, men, men's group, women's group of, called men, men of focus, women of focus, that are really seeing people get help. Jay Stringer has a book out uh, that you really wanna read called Unwanted, How Sexual Brokenness Reveals Our Way to Healing. And it has helped so many people here find freedom. In our Bible reading, if you're, this week, I mean, we're just reading about God telling Israel to go in and just decimate, you know, these cultures. And the reason he did that is because th these cultures, these, these people groups, uh, they centered around sexual perversion and baby sacrifice. And, and they'd given themselves to this. So, so God wanted to clean that out. And, you know, here we are. I mean, that's why we're, we gotta pull out of this culture of porn and death right now that we're in. Abortion on demand is one of the, one of the direct byproducts of a pornified culture. It's why we're connected to a ministry like Thrive that's helping young families choose life. I'm, man, I am so proud of these guys. The third reason for marriage is to display the permanence of God's commitment to us. This is that profound mystery that Paul's writing about in Ephesians 5. He quotes Genesis here, Verse 31, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. A man and woman coming together is actually a picture of Jesus and his church. We are the bride, and he's the bridegroom who's coming back for us. God's commitment is permanent. It's eternal. And he created marriage to display that to those who don't yet know him. That's why marriage is called a sacred bond. It's also why serial dating is training for divorce. You date somebody till you don't like them anymore and you break up and you get into another relationship until you don't like them and you break up and on and on it goes. And then when you finally tie the knot, it keeps coming untied. Why is that? Well, people say, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for my soulmate. I'm looking for that one person who complete, completes me. Now, I hate to break it to you, but that is a total myth. I mean, the Bible version of soulmate, you know, you know how the Bible spells that? S-O-L-E, one mate, a singular mate for a lifetime because marriage is a picture of God's permanent love and commitment to us. And that's what marriage is. It's a commitment you make. God loves us when we're sweet and when we're a hot mess. I mean, when we turn our back on him, when we run away from him, when we refuse to talk to him, blame him for the bad stuff that's happening in our lives, even when we watch porn, when we cheat, he's always running after us, calling us back. That's why that song, Reckless Love, went viral. I mean, everybody was listening to that. Jesus wants us to love our spouse like that. It's what marriage is meant to look like. Now, I'll tell you, one of the secrets 
to Debbie and me staying together for 43 years on that bed, crying our eyes out on our honeymoon, we made a pact that we would never use the word divorce as a threat. And, and, and that is the one commitment we have. I mean, we, we don't even use the word. We don't even talk about it. We had colossal arguments over the years, but the word divorce is out of bounds. It's never used. The Greek word Jesus used in Matthew 19 that's translated be united means to be glued together. It literally means be bonded in a way that can't be separated without serious consequences. Some of you told me about going through your own divorce and how it just felt like your heart was getting ripped out. In fact, I've had so many people say this was far worse than a death. It was just, it was just gut-wrenching. When you, you try to separate two pieces of construction paper that have been glued together, there's a lot of tearing. And part of one stays on the other. That's a picture right there, you're looking at it, of what happens when two become one flesh and then try to separate. It tears us apart. It leaves pieces of us on them and them on us. Now I know some of you grew up in a home where you watch this up close and personal. I mean, you, you have decided, I want nothing to do with marriage, I'm not gonna go through that. You need to hear me say marriage is good. You know, God designed it to help us. It is a wonderful thing. But some of you need to hear marriage is hard because you want it so bad, you're willing to risk venturing into it with the wrong partner. And I'm telling you, if you make your bed in hell, God will be with you. <laughs> But it's a whole lot easier to not do it, <laughs> to take your time, find somebody who's on the same path, the loving God that you are on, who's gonna be willing to complete the project with you, because that's been an unfortunate thing that's happened. A lot of people just bail. So how do you know if you're even up for it? In your singleness, you have a helper and best friend who desires a relationship with you that can complete you, that will complete. Take the fellowship, trust prayer list, and learn how to connect with him. Learn how to quiet your soul and hear his voice and follow his leadership. And when you're looking for a partner, look for somebody who's on the same path. Somebody who's walking with Jesus, who's committed to prayer and obedience to God's words. Because if both of you are not complete in your relationship with him, then you're not fit for marriage. I mean, that's why we're seeing so much wreckage right now. You wanna find your wholeness in him. I can tell you the funny story of Debbie and me dating, but, but the bottom line thing that drew me, kept drawing me back to her is the woman knew God. You know, she knew God in a way I wanted to know God. Our culture is on fire right now. I mean, we are, we are caught in a Psalm 2 moment where the leaders of our nation, the, the, the big tech, big pharma, have colluded to throw off any restraint from the God of the Bible in this church. They wanna throw away God's definition of marriage and even question our being formed in his image as male and female. And it's happened fast. If you're trying to obey God right now, you're swimming upstream. You know, it, it, that's why it feels so hard. We're being brainwashed and just acquiesce, do whatever we're told, believe whatever the narrative is out there, whatever the, the media is selling us, the government, the big tech is pushing and the movies, and the TV shows. I mean, they're all, going, they're all together in it. I'm watching uh, people the other day at my grandson's outdoor tennis match. This, this just blew me away. They're miles apart, outside in the sunshine, wearing masks. I mean, don't you think it's time to start asking ourselves, what are we doing? What in the world? is going on here, how is it, wait, 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 wait a minute, how is it you can go to places in St. Charles and not wear a mask, but you can't do that in St. Louis County? I think it's the Missouri River. I think there's something <laughs> mystical. And if you go to Florida, even the waiters don't wear masks. So what in the world? Yeah, I know. I don't, don't move to Florida. <laughs> you know, they're using the word science to describe almost anything they want it to mean. Or should I say they want us to do. Science is 
the observation of objective fact. It's not speculation. I think the media is spreading fear right now. I'm sorry to you know, say that, but I, I, you know, it's, it, the evidence is, in, is no longer important. I mean, uh, they're trying to keep us from getting back together, and, and the isolation is more dangerous than COVID. Fear sells. I mean, the next big thing they're loading the fear guns with are lies about climate change. Science is getting twisted and deconstructed to support whatever narrative they're pushing. We gotta move against this. I mean, we have got to get out of our homes. Christians need camaraderie with other believers. <laughs> Hebrews, Hebrews 10:25 says, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I mean, this is where we're at right now. And in particular, I wanna challenge all of you men. It is vital right now that we get fueled up to be the men of God that he has called us to be. We need some wild at heart moments to free ourselves you know, from the bombardment of a culture that's making us feel guilty for being male. We're, we're not gonna be able to lead our homes if we keep getting our core identity eroded and feminized by a progressive media. And that's what's happening. Next weekend, we're having a men's retreat at Lake Williamson with my dear friend, Billy Humphrey. You guys, I know if you remember the last one, you love this guy. Uh, these couple of days, they're gonna refresh you, refuel you, they'll challenge you, equip you to be the man God designed you to be, and you're gonna have a whole lot of fun. They've got a great schedule of activities. Our team is gonna be out in the atrium after this service so uh, you can sign up for it or you can still do that online. Don't miss this opportunity to connect with your brothers in Christ because you're, you're gonna meet so many guys dealing with the same stuff you're dealing with and uh, it's gonna build camaraderie. You'll come back with new friends. So uh, take advantage of this. I really believe breakthrough's coming. Yes, it is. But right now we're caught in a cultural Christianity moment. That's the only way I know how to describe this, where you know, we've just been hanging together because we like the idea of Christianity. But there is a huge deception that has come into the church that is bent on just deconstructing our beliefs, challenging our faith. The devil's asking the same questions he asked me. Did God really say sex outside of marriage is wrong? God wants me to be happy, right? No, God wants you to be like his son. You know, he wants you to live with him forever. And this life is about getting you ready for that. Marriage is a crucible where your heart gets reshaped. Some of you have been daydreaming about divorce. Instead of fantasizing about how wonderful it'd be to be single again, put your heart back into your relationship. Recommit, start asking God to soften your heart to help you love your spouse. And young people, start asking God to make you the person somebody would wanna marry. We, have, we, we gotta wake up, we gotta pull out of this fantasy that life's all about me, it's all about my fulfillment. We've been on this track and it's killing us. If you're struggling to stay together, please get help. Don't just go with the advice your girlfriends at work are giving you to ditch the bum. I mean, I can't tell you how many marriages have ended over that kind of stuff. You know, get some marriage counseling. We can recommend some excellent Christian marriage counselors. And, and we also offer biblical counseling here at the church. Call the office. I'm telling you, the grass is only greener on the side of the fence you water. Visit second time around. This is a small group that meets on campus for previously married couples. Young Couples Connection is a group focused on growing spiritually, helping each other finish the marriage project. We need that support. Our Grace to Love class, I mean, we got all these resources. Our Grace to Love class, the weekend seminar designed to teach you the basics for building relationships, whether you're married, engaged, or just dating. The next one of that, uh, for that is in July. And our Love and Respect class is gonna be starting back up again. I, I, I'm telling you, I don't think there is a better book than what Emerson Egridge's wrote. And he's got an interesting name, but it's just simply love and respect. That, that, that is the book, the definitive book. So let's pray. <laughs> I wasn't trying to load you down, but I want us to have a biblical understanding of what God's plan was. And Lord, we are asking, we, we're against the current right now to even be talking this way, to be, even be doing this, because the culture has just really abandoned the whole idea for the most part. 
And so we're asking God, as your kids, help us. Help us recommit, help us get committed to, to doing this your way, to doing it right. God, help us. Help us to build loving families here. Turn things around for the sake of, of, of your glory, for the sake of your fame, Lord. Turn things around in your church. Help us to pull out of this me first business. We're asking you, pour grace on us, Lord. Pour your mercy on us, God. Give us a heart to reconnect with our spouse. And for those who are uh, still single, God, help them to take this to heart and to begin to develop their relationship with you so they're ready for marriage, so they're, they're able to enter into this kind of covenant relationship. We just thank you for this. We thank you for your, your, your presence here. We thank you, God, for your conviction. We thank you, God, for the unbelievable tools that you've given us and for the Holy Spirit who lives in us to help us get this project complete, to help us stand before you and hear you say, well done. Amen, amen, amen. I am really encouraged by, uh, you know, just knowing that we've got all of these resources that, I mean, this is, this is golden. You've got all kinds of options and opportunities to, to you know, develop the skill to make this work. And it is, it is developing skills as we're gonna get into this. I mean, <laughs> learning to relate to each other as the opposite sex is a, I mean, it's a trippy thing. <laughs> we are different. God made us different. That's, that's what, when I hear, you know, the, this whole gender dysphoria thing, I'm just thinking, are you kidding me? We are different to the very core of our anatomy. And so the Lord's gonna help us. He's gonna help us to be a, a light during this. If you're, if you're watching this, you don't have a relationship with God, I mean, that's where this whole thing starts. You're, you're not gonna get anywhere until you really connect with him. That's what the, the whole New Testament is about. It's about God come, becoming one of us so that he could absorb in his own human body all of the garbage that is keeping us from him, that's keeping us from having a relationship. The Bible says God nailed our sins to Jesus' cross. And you know what that means? That means that right now, you can experience a relationship. You can experience what it means to have eternal life. Jesus is talking to a guy who was a Pharisee and named Nicodemus, and he said, you can't even see the kingdom of God until you're born again, until you are spiritually recreated. And that happens now, that can happen now because Jesus came out of that tomb as the first of a new creation, as the firstborn. And he's here right now to make that a reality to you. If this makes sense, that's a miracle because God's revealing this to you. He's showing you this, and here's how you can act on it. I'm, I'm, let's all stand up. Here, here's how those of you who are watching this and those of you here can experience what it means to be born again. All right? We're just gonna, Lord, I'm asking right now, let this reality of this, let the seriousness, uh, seriousness of this moment just dawn on every heart. This is you inviting us into your family. And so we wanna respond to you. We wanna to respond to your Holy Spirit's invitation. So, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you a prayer to pray. Let's just say these words together. Jesus, I put my total trust in what you did for me on the cross. I surrender my life to you. I receive your gift of eternal life and the forgiveness for all of my sin. And I invite your Holy Spirit to fill me in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I wanna give you something. We wanna, we wanna help you get started in your relationship with the Lord. So we've got a prayer team that's gonna be down here at the end. They, they wanna actually give you a piece of the New Testament that'll really help you get started. And if you're watching this, just text, you can text the word commit to this number, 314-310-30314. And we'd like to send you something 
And again, it's just been so good to have Ryan here with us. This has just been such a wonderful weekend. So, uh, so we're gonna we're gonna just sing about what we're kind of talking about here. God, I'm gonna build my life on your love. Touch us, Lord, as we sing, as we worship. Just come, Holy Spirit, and saturate our hearts, saturate our minds. In Jesus' name. times you've got to start saying the truth you've got to start speaking these things again because it's it's gonna get weirder and weirder it's gonna feel weirder and weirder to say what the Bible says about marriage it's gonna feel weirder and weirder to hear the words so we've just got to we we got to dig down and say God we are going to say true to your intentions, to what you declare, 
to what you have stated. We're not gonna drift with the culture. We're not gonna become a progressive church. We're gonna, we're gonna stay true to biblical inerrancy. We're gonna stay true to what you say about Jesus and what you say about his blood being the only thing that can cleanse our sin. We gotta start saying it, guys. We gotta start saying the words because it's gonna get more and more difficult if we don't. I just, you know, I feel like sometimes, I know it's hard to hear this stuff and it's, it, it almost irritates you, but it's clearing the air of demonic interference, traffic, when we just speak these things and say, this is what God wants. He wants something wonderful for us. And we're being sold a counterfeit. So, you know, I pray, God, that you just take these words and you burn them into our hearts and you give us confidence and boldness to start speaking the truth in love, but speaking it with boldness and authority. I pray, God, for the young people in our church. God, help them to hold on to these values and these goals. Help them, God. Help them to not be sucked into to what is being sold in the world. Keep them, protect them, guard them from porn. Help them, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' powerful name. And everybody said, amen, amen. All right, God bless you guys. Billy Humphrey's gonna actually take the weekend service next weekend, because I want you guys to hear this guy. I love this dude. All right, be back here for that. See you. The Lord is so good. I am trusting that you are encouraged, that you feel strength and the grace of God to be better at in our relationships, in our marriages, and, and also just maybe a, a, an ounce or two of clearer understanding of who Jesus is in the gospel. I'm really hopeful that you have a great day and a great week. God bless you.